Hey everybody, welcome to the stream. Give everybody a few more minutes to get settled in. Just going to do some work on Beaker today. Grab some coffee. How's everybody's weekend going? If you're in Austin, Texas like me, you're probably excited to be able to drink water again soon. We've had a boil notice for the past week. It's taken forever. There was some flooding and uh, all of the uh, water, water processing got backed up. And so we have Elevated levels of bacteria in the water supply, and so we've had to boil all of our water. Hey, Andrew. I know you're dealing with the water, right? You're still in Austin, aren't you? Where did you move? You got away just in time. <laughs> he also moved away right before uh, the election. We could have could have used you. I'll try to keep politics out of this though. Oh, that was interesting. Let's get GitHub issues open here. I'm going to be doing some pull requests first. Um, I'm going to be reviewing some stuff that Septis has been working on, and Septis is actually in the stream with us. So <laughs> I'll try not to embarrass you or anything, Septis. Right on, man. <sighs> Only, let's see, is it November yet? It's not November yet, so. Less than two weeks left. All right. So the first thing is um, going to be reviewing this PR that Septis did for a fab icon drawing tool, which I'm super excited about. Um, I think Sophie said that this is not quite finished yet, so maybe we'll test it, check over the code, and then uh, just review the PR. Cool, all right. 
right, so have icon maker code, it's specifying the grid, this all looks good, this is a modal, it's all looking pretty good. I'm excited to show everybody what this is. This is going to be a really neat new feature. Basically we have a fav icon picking tool in Beaker. Why don't I go ahead and get this thing checked out. We have a fav icon picking tool for whenever you make a website and uh, Septes was like, you know what we really need? We need a way to draw your own fav icon. So he has been working on that. Which I love because I love any opportunity to be a little more creative and customize these things. You see those fav icons all the time in your library view and up in the tabs and everything. So wouldn't it be nice if you could draw yourself a little fav icon? So that's what this is going to be. All right, my computer is really, really, really chugging lately. So, hope y'all don't mind the load times. Let's jump into the library here, get into a test site of some kind. Give it a shot. Oh, you got a PR to Beaker Core. That would make sense. Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and send that PR in real quick? That means this probably won't. Probably be able to hit the UI, but I bet that the actual site, which for some reason is not rendering. Oh, you're mobile. All right. Okay, and I can clear it. That's cool. So the eraser is being a little aggressive. It's for some reason erasing the grid lines. We'll need to figure that out. Oh, I can kind of see why that would be because whenever you draw, it actually draws over the grid lines too, which makes sense. The eraser just needs to restore those if possible. But what do you think, Septi? Should I do a little bit of work on uh, the UI element? Okay, now that preview is working again, so that's interesting. Do you think we should uh, work on it on the stream, or uh, should I give you a little more time? I'm guessing that's what that timer is, is that it waits for you to finish drawing and then refreshes the preview down there. Yeah. You know, I wonder if we could speed that up because that's a lot of delay. In fact, I'm wondering if we could do that in real time. Cool, okay. So let's see, I, th I think the idea of having the grid, first of all, palette's looking great. We had to talk about that a little bit. Palette, palette looks good. The tooling, yeah, it looks good. That resolution choice makes sense there. Yeah, layout feels good to me. I think the two things on my mind, yeah, that's cool. And then you could even do a little bit of more fine grained coloring after you've done the big blocks. I think the two things that need to ch change are just that the eraser probably ought to restore the grid and that the preview ought to go in, re uh, in real time. Is there any, uh, yeah, no problem doing real time? All right, then let's, let's get into that. Let me finish looking through the code here, make sure I have my head around all the pieces. Should mostly be inside that modal. Yeah, and then there's the mechanics and the CSS. Yeah, all right, well, first of all, let me just say good work, Septis. This is all 
the uh, solid quality that your PRs are pretty consistently at, so good work there as usual. Um, let's dig in to some of this UI code, see if I can't, uh, yeah, just remove the timeout, let's start there. You didn't put that timeout in there for any performance reasons, right? It was just uh, usability. Okay, save that, let that recompile, and then we'll give it a shot. Cool, okay. <clears throat> it's given that broken. Yeah, you know, I wonder. Let's even try having it render not even just after a click, but as you draw. Because I can imagine actually doing the drawing and actually watching down there. So let's take this whole preview code. Move it somewhere else. Get rid of all the timeout stuff. Let's go and make a little helper function. Render preview. This is such a small canvas. I feel like we can get away with running this function every time a pixel changes. I don't think that'll be too CPU intensive or memory intensive. All right, so then we got the fill pixel function and we'll do it right there. So while I'm working on this, has anybody tried out any new peer-to-peer -peer tech, new blockchain tech, new distributed system tech they feel like they ought to talk about? Or if you're working on something, feel free to talk about it in the chat. I'd be interested to hear. Yeah, that performs pretty well. And I feel like that's nice to be able to see that. So that's cool. Um, okay. Let's just, okay, and the clear needs to run it. So let's see. Okay, so just to update it so it'll run. And then probably the, the fact that it's not rendering, it's showing that broken image at the outset's probably related to, yeah, okay, so that's right there. So we just need to call render preview after the first render call. That'll probably fix that problem. Let's see where it's right there. It is right there. So right here. Yeah, really great work on this, FTS. We might want to put a box around it so people 
like see it ahead of time. Let's see what it feels like to use this tool real quick. the cat's yelling outside man told <laughs> wow we are gonna get some really pretty uh, pixel art out of this tool I guarantee it <laughs> right can't save it right now Totes, I haven't seen totes. Tell me about totes. Okay. What else? Okay, let's see if we can fix that grid. So the eraser tool. Okay, so the eraser tool is just white. Yeah, you're just drawing white, and that's losing the grid. Interesting. I wonder if we can keep the grid. Uh, let me think. One way we could keep solve that is actually just have the grid overlay on top of the drawing. Let me grab that cat. <sighs> Let me see what it looks like to render the grid over everything. So let's see. How does the grid work first? Okay, so you had a grid drawing function at one point. Is the grid a background image? It is. That makes sense. I see what's going on and then we're drawing on top of it. That makes sense. We act like web components without compiling. Eric, I haven't seen totes, but I've seen um, Tonic, which Paolo Fragamonti uh, wrote, and it's a similar idea, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> Sorry, Neko. Okay, yes, it is possible it could grab the clicks, so you've got the Z index right put on top. There's a trick to that, though. Let's put it on top here, and then you could do pointer events none. And that should, yeah, boom, got it. So we can put the grid on top and then, uh, and then just tell it not to receive pointer events with this little bit of CSS right there. So let's jump to the CSS of the Fab Icon Maker. And put this guy on top. Corner events. No. Yeah, what did you think of so tonic? Andrew, do you think it's got staying power? Because I definitely want to have what it's doing, you know? Um, yeah, no, no problem, Septis. Um, I definitely like what's, what Tonic is doing as a concept, and it's like, the basic thing I'm thinking as I'm looking at it is, is it going to work the way I need it to? Or is it going to get to some kind of point where the, uh, some choice ends up 
not working that well. You know, it's just hard to dedicate to a to a fresh project like that. But uh, but I do like what Tonic is doing. That is the scariest path I've gone ever. <laughs> oh, man. Mm, curse or crosshair while we're over it? We could try it. Yeah, docks are a little sparse. Hmm. What do y'all think? Cursor crosshair? The other thing I'm wondering is if we ought to be actually even providing an 8x8 eight eight because 16x16, uh, 16 16, it's a little hard to to draw. I'm just wondering, you know, like I'm going to be wanting to basically throw in these fab icons really fast, and I'm kind of thinking maybe a, a eight by eight might speed things up for me a little bit. But I really don't need a whole lot of resolution here. You know, they're going to look pixelated no matter what if I'm using this tool. Let Tara do the art. I agree about that. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try throwing in an 8x8 and uh, in addition to these other resolutions. Also, I kind of think I like the cursor. So let's let's go ahead and make the, these changes. Let's add an eight by eight, and let's um, let's use the cursor. Okay, so grid size, and let's default it to eight. So we're going to need to render another one of these things. I'll probably need to look at how you've been doing that and put together the execution of that code. Okay, so grid size, grid size. Okay, grid 16 looks like that's a reference to the image that you're setting, so I'll need to make a grid 8. I'm going to go ahead and copy the grid 16 for the moment. So what we should get with this is 8x8 should be in there, but the grid will render incorrectly. I'll have to render a new grid in a minute. Like Septi says, that should be pretty straightforward. 
got that nice little render function he left in the comments. Yeah, there's some fat pixels right there. Yeah, I definitely think this is what we ought to do for the default size because this makes it a lot easier to just throw together a real quick one off. And I bet it's going to be a lot of stuff like this, little patterns. Yeah, that feels pretty good to me. So let's get that 8x8 eight eight grid. So now I just want to play with this thing. All right, uh, cancel that, and let's get that grid right. Palette being too bright. I don't know. We can always tweak that a little bit later. So it looks like grid source, as he said, we can do a grid source. Spit out the canvas down to your all. Yeah, that's it right there. So, I think I can console.log this guy, and I need to, let's see, alright, so it looks like it's using the parameters being set here, so this should actually dump out the URL we need, I call it right at the outset. but this has got the Mario theme stuck in my head. Come on, buddy. There's our URL. Copy that. We have to draw a grid call. Paste it on in here. Hmm, why is it longer? Or shouldn't it be longer? Shouldn't be a bigger image than. Stuff get calculated. Hmm. I don't know why that well, maybe it rendered correctly. <clears throat> Let's give it a shot. What 
else might we want to do here? I think this will be it, actually. We can just get the grid. Bet you good money. This is going to be one of those features that people ask a lot of changes to. Stuff like, hey, can I get Control Z in there? Wouldn't blame them. Okay, yeah, rendered correctly. Sweet. Very, very cool. And then we just need to put a border or something around that. Okay, and then the size of that is changing. That's interesting. I guess because the actual icon being output is getting changed in its size right now. We should probably have the output. At, is that accurate, Septis? The uh, okay. Catch you later, man. Looks like the size of the output icon is actually being changed by the grid size, which we probably don't want. That we probably actually want it to scale up and just be pixelated and always the same size. We can deal with that later. Okay, so let's finish commenting out the draw grid. Okay, so let's commit some of these changes. good and separate up our commits as we should. Yeah, this is just one of many great PRs that Septis has been doing and is working on. I can't wait to see some of the new stuff that he's putting together. I guess we are sort of talking about it. He's um, working on a new editor built on Monaco that I'm really excited to get in. Because our inline editor right now is solid. It was a good start. But uh, sometimes you really... Sometimes you really just want... Uh, to have uh, a full featured editor in the browser and you don't want to have to jump out into uh, an external editor. So we're just going to bring in Monaco and put in a full on editor application, which I think especially newer developers will appreciate. Because, uh, yeah, the more like you'll get a file tree on the left side and be able to open up multiple, have multiple buffers open while you're working. And then once you're done, I mean, you can see all the changes that you've got queued up if you're in preview mode and then publish it. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a good tool. Just trying to make publishing as good as possible, publishing and building.
Meanwhile, I have been doing all kinds of spec work lately. And we're not quite ready to talk about everything, but we've been basically thinking about, okay, what's next, right? We got to 08. We got publishing in a place that we wanted it to be. What next? And that has been what I've been working on. So this UI needs to change, but I don't know how yet. I'm going to leave that for set days to work on. How should this be done? <laughs> Let's see if we can get all these to fit on a single row. Eric, I'm glad to hear preview mode is working for you. We uh, it took us a while to get that right. Sorry it took us so long. But yeah, I feel like that finally has gotten to a good place. Uh, and yeah, I've been working on the record protocol stuff. I don't actually, I actually right before the stream finished all the work I had done on the record protocol stuff. And I kind of stepped back and went, eh, I'm not sure that's the right solution. <laughs> um, it didn't, doesn't quite feel right yet. Okay, part of the problem here is the spacing. But that's not the right way to solve the spacing. There's too much padding on the bottom. Yeah, maybe we just need to change up these button styles. No, I don't know. I don't know if I love that. Here's the question. Why are these buttons so fat? Because it's a flex, that's why. Yeah, the record protocol concept is close to what they ought to be, but not quite right, I think. Um, I'm kind of I'm trying to come up with something that's lightweight. I don't want to like over-specify the solution here. These buttons feel kind of enormous now. I don't want to overspecify a solution that's just kind of not that great to use. I don't want it to feel bad to use. Uh, but I also um, want to make sure we have enough structure so that people building applications can build, you know, apps that work with each other. I don't want everything to get siloed off, and I want to make sure. I mean, the, the idea with the record protocols is we need a way to explain to users um, what kind of data is in their site and what kind of data. Applications are going to be um, sorry, not kind of what, what kind of app, 
kind of data is in their profile, right? What, what have you published, what records you have. And we need a way for apps to say, hey, I'd like to be able to read and write your contacts. I'd like to be able to read and write your status updates, stuff like that. And so we need to think of like, a, it's both metadata and security information. And we need a nice way to make all that play nicely. And I haven't quite cracked what I think is the best way to do it. Meanwhile, I've got these buttons to figure out. That's not terrible. It's not great. It's not terrible. I don't know. What do y'all think? It's not great, but it also might work for now. That's kind of what I'm leaning towards for that. Okay, this is in the fab icon picker. Am I reinventing XML schemas? I could be accused of such a thing. It probably would not be inaccurate to say something like I am reinventing XML schemas. It's not that I'm just reinventing XML schemas, I hope. There's some practical requirements here. I have a little little blurb inside the FAC on the record protocols spec where I talk about the difference between what I'm doing in RDF. Um, it's not just compatibility, though that's a big part of it. Permissioning is another really big part of it. I want to make sure that applications can work together around a shared set of files. Make sure they understand what the files are. Um, need to make sure that they, we can communicate to the user what access is being given so that an app that starts using their data, you can tell what's, uh, what's going to be accessed and how and do the permissioning. Um, and I want to make it easy for applications to do this kind of stuff and not accidentally create conflicts or screw each other up. So you have to come up with some kind of middle ground where the applications are building compatible uses of, uses of data, um, which means some kind of way of putting a boundary around the data but still keeping it accessible. And the boundary that I'm messing with right now is basically what this idea is a rep record protocol. You create a DAT, you publish in it a bunch of JSON schemas and metadata about the data that's supposed to be in a folder. And you say like, okay, I'm using the fritter.com record protocol here. Um, and so all the files under slash records slash fritter.com are gonna be managed by the schemas and the metadata at fritter.com sort of a way to give you definitive knowledge about what kind of information is there and what kind of access patterns should be allowed and what kind of schemas should be allowed. That's the idea. 
And I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea, actually. That's not my problem at the moment. My problem at the moment is that uh, I don't feel like the tools feel good to use as a developer. I'm not happy with the uh, design of it at, quite yet. So I'm going to step back and look at perhaps something um, focused more on how file systems work, perhaps, where you can, I don't know, I'm going to keep on working on it because I'm not totally happy. Upload is for importing. Maybe we should change that to import instead of upload. Because you're not actually uploading anymore. anywhere, you're importing. And I agree with you, Mike, that the right padding on there is weird, so I'm going to need to find a way to space these things out correctly. So the margin right might not be the right way to do it. That's a good way to evenly space out flex items. That's not something I've cracked yet. Uh, Eric, that's about right. I want to make sure that there's a, I, I'm trying to create strict definitions of schemas, basically, that are canonical, they're globally published. And uh, something like JSON-LD tries to accomplish that. In, in a second, actually, why don't I get into that in a second. Uh, Adamantis, good to see you. Okay, so while that's compiling, um, my understanding of RDF is basically that it works like this. You got some schema, let's say, for a person. The basic premise is if you were to arrive at this schema, um, you don't really necessarily know, like these schema name, these attribute names are ambiguous in a global sense. Um, first name could, well, you know, these are intuitively they make a lot of sense, but technically these are just short names. They could have a lot of different meanings. Employer, for instance, may need to be uh, an object. My understanding is the way that RDF works is it's sort of trying to replace each of these ambiguous short names of attributes with fully qualified URLs. So it would be like uh, um, fooschema.org slash first name all. And you would basically be using URLs for every one of these attributes. That way there's no ambiguity about what the attribute is referencing, right? You're basically encoding the full schema information in there. JSON-LD is a way to do this, but then also sort of compress the representation down. So you use something like, it's called a context, and I don't remember the exact um, syntax for the context attribute, but you then can compress this down to having like um, shortened like foo schema colon And uh, inside the context somewhere, you're mapping a foo schema org gets mapped to foo, so that you can do these colon prefixes and so on and so forth. And I just don't want to have to interact with JavaScript objects this way. Uh, I just think that's a neither this nor even this compressed short uh, prefix form entices me. The context syntax, if you look at JSON-LD, is not as obvious as I think it should be. Um, 
and all this still sort of puts you in a zone where you have to be thinking about all the different possible, like you're basically doing this with the expectation that multiple different schemas could be used in the same file. Um, and as a developer, I really want to just have a single schema, and then if I need to import other schemas or use other schemas, I'm going to link to them instead. So I would prefer to be able to say that this is a foo-schema.org slash person, let's say, and then have the rest of it work just like this. That's just my first observation on a usability level about what I would prefer for how objects work. And then have this foo-schema.org actually be machine readable and able to enforce this so that I always know if I'm reading something that's supposed to be a foo-schema.org person, it's going to match the schema and I'm not going to have my applications randomly break on me. And then it becomes foo-schema.org's job to maintain the semantics of the schemas it puts out. So I'm basically trying to trying to make the entire world of data that gets published in the P2P web be um, strictly enforced through machine readable uh, specifications. Uh, simultaneously, I want these foo-schema.org person information to tell me things like this thing is a person, and you're able to do the following different permissions. If you're going to read it, you're going to be reading people records. And if you're going to create one, create new people, and so on and so forth. So then whenever an application says, hey, I would love to be interacting with the foo-schema.org person data on Paul's profile dat, the browser can say, hey, this app wants to read your people records and create new people records. And then whenever it does that, it can read and write following the schema. So I'm just trying to keep everything structured because having lots of applications interoperating with each other is a complete nightmare. And there's got to be a couple of ways that we can make it smooth and avoid some uh, usability problems and some, and some applications breaking. That's the idea. But if you want to take a look at the record protocol stuff that I worked on, which was my kind of first pass at solving this, Actually, not even close to my first pass, but the most recent pass. Um, uh, let me get the link real quick. But you should only look at this as a sort of, oh, this is interesting, as opposed to thinking, oh, this is how it's going to work, because I have not at all decided to stick with record protocols. It's just one uh, thing I'm toying with, but there's the link in the chat. And Amantis asks if it would be possible to disable JavaScript, and the options are somewhere in the button on the fly. I really would love to have that feature. Um, I need something in Electron before I can do it. There's a, it's an API in Chromium that's not exposed in Electron yet, and as soon as we get that implemented in Electron, I can implement it as a tool to disable JavaScript selectively on pages as you browse. I think that would be great to be able to make JavaScript an opt-in. Okay, back to the UI that I'm working on. Let's just fix this small padding problem. And I think the way I'm going to do that is by, you know, this is really what the grid is better for, but I don't know the grid syntax well enough. Anyway, I hope all that about the um, hope all that about the record protocols made some amount of sense. Did my last child not work? Why not? There it goes. Import feels like it may still be the wrong word. Like, use file might be right, but I don't know if I have enough space for that. I'm going to stick with... Uh, let's 
stick with these buttons for now because it's good enough and uh, maybe reorder them. Maybe put create on the Michael Sullivan asks, can't schema integrity be enforced locally via Beaker? That is exactly what I'm after. Trying to get schema integrity to be enforced by having people that create schemas publish them as JSON schema objects, and then you import those definitions, and everybody that says, I'm going to use fritter.com slash post.json as the schema, the browser will actually make you have to use that schema. It will enforce it mechanically. Hey Moritz, we're just working on a fav icon drawing tool that um, is being built by uh, Septies and just doing a little PR review and fixing up a few bugs and stuff like that. Right import would make sense if you were pulling it from another URL. Let's see if I can fit in use file. Or maybe just maybe load. Or open. Uh, any chances for Beaker for Android? We're not, we don't have any mobile project on the roadmap yet, sadly. Use file anyway. Let's try to open. And let's get the right path icon. I load when you can upload? Such a good question. One spec that I'm working on that I'm actually pretty excited about, like some of the spec work, I've been doing a lot of spec work. Record protocols is just one of them. And one of the specs I'm doing is uh, getting more serious about the DAT types. And uh, one thing that I think will be really cool is uh, by default, any DAT is a website. But if you specify a type and website isn't in there, uh, it won't automatically render HTML whenever you visit it, which is a, I think, going to be a really good security feature because then you can create DATs and not, it's basically like the website type for a DAT is like the executable bit. When you visit an HTML file on a DAT that's a website, you're going to be executing it automatically. And so by having these types and saying, okay, unless there's no type or if there's types and if, if the website type has to be specified um, or no type can be set and that becomes a website and if it's not specified you're not going to execute any code automatically which means that we can create dats that are designed just for data and not worry that they're going to be executed which I think is a really important feature to have in some cases okay uh, folder Yeah, bike shedding, it never ends. Bike shedding is just designing with multiple people, man. Don't fear the bike shed. Be right back. I think this is going to finally finish this button redesign. Open.
That feels all right to me. Yeah. The annoying viewing of RSS and the browser data hijacking. I don't know if I know that particular issue, but I do know that yeah, if we get types, we can start to do interesting things where if websites are not the only things that are in DATS, you could even start to do things where um, if you don't have the website type, you can look at the type and be like, okay, this is a type, um, you know, let's say um, data set. Let's you could let's go higher level. You can do type um, type um, social media profile, and then uh, <clears throat> what I would love to have some days when you visit one of those things, the browser then goes, okay, there's no HTML that we're going to render here. It's not a website. Why don't I load up the social media app that the user has already installed? and use that to render the page. So you can actually kind of do this mixing and matching where you visit somewhere and then some pre-installed software gets loaded up to render the page uh, appropriately. So it's like semantic data being published in these dats and then they completely, we completely separate out the content slash data with the, the application logic so that the user is able to choose what they want to use to visit, you know, to view a uh, social media profile dat or something like that. I think that could be cool. You could also have the website type be overridden so that if it's like a social, if it has its own website, but it's also a social media profile dat, you could have, as the user say, anytime you land there, don't display the website, but I'll display the app that I chose. And then if I want to, I'll switch over and see what their website looks like. So sort of like multiple views on top of the same dat or same website. I think that could be really fun. Let's go ahead and PR these into the PR he's working on. His branch, which means they need to compare across forks. What is the name of his fork? Yeah, Septimus Five Icon Drive. Hmm. Come on, GitHub. Don't you know?
swear I know how to do this. I should be able to make a PR to Septimus's branch somehow, but I can't seem to figure out how. Okay, so this is mine, and that's his. And I want to PR to his PR to his branch. GitHub has just decided that I can't do that. I mean, question number one, why is his version of Beaker not showing up inside of the forks? That's really confusing to me. Finally, got it. So let's see, that's all of that PR. Let's jump over to another one. And that is a couple of, this one might be a kind of a pain to debug. Let's take a look at what he did. Basically, yeah, there's a case where these menus can get, need to scroll automatically. That looks good question I have is, is there a scroll bar that's going to show up in Windows all the time? I need to make sure the scroll bar is hidden. I'll review this one later. Let's hit one other thing that I've been needing to hit. Um, when we switched from 07 to 08, there was an internal data model change where if you had a local folder set, the attribute that was storing that information changed from one value, one attribute to another, and I forgot to put in a migration. And some people lost their mappings of whatever they were working on, and that's no good. So I'm going to write some code to do that migration. So uh, it went from local path to local sync path, 
purely for historic iterative reasons. 08 took forever and we went through a lots of different iterations on it. And so now, honestly, local path and local sync path both mean the same stupid thing. But basically, people had a local path set and it got lost to local sync path. That's no good. So I need to write a little bit of code that looks through the database and says, okay, if there's a local path set, but not a local sync path set, let's go ahead and copy that value over and turn on preview mode so that we're not automatically publishing anything. I hope I won't regret this move. It seems like one of those things that really is asking to screw somebody up somehow in an unpredictable way. But I also feel bad about losing people's configuration. Migrations are tough. I actually had old code for doing this, so let's look up the old code. I did this originally back when, uh, well, I tried having this code in at one point and there was a bug, so hopefully I can fix it this time around. Quality software. We've been getting a lot of good feedback about pure sockets. People are excited about that. I'm really pumped to get that out. And here it is. That's similar. Migrations. I ran this inside of the cast database. Download. Okay. Let's give it a shot. I'm not scared. I'm not scared.
Yeah, Pure Sockets, he uh, is waiting on Matthias wrapping up some work on Hyperswarm um, before I can finish it out, so we got that PR waiting for that to get done. Now, if I'm being really responsible, what I would do to work on this is I would open up, I would check out an 07 branch. This is probably what I'm going to do. I'm going to be responsible. When I open up a 07 branch, I'm going to, which is going to be a crazy blast from the past, and I'm going to create some data to work off of so that I can test against it and make sure that I'm not going to cause any problems. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to save this, and I'm going to go and check out the 07 version. We'll do the last 07 version, which is probably what people will be on. Gonna have to do a full reinstall, so while that's going. Hey, welcome back, Septies. Something that we are playing around with right now. Can't make any promises about when and if this is going to happen, but something we've been playing around with is the idea of it um, would be really nice if we could have a completely peer-to-peer -peer web um, where you could sit down and basically have the full experience be, you know, just as much as possible serverless. And one of the things that kind of stops that from happening is you got to find content, you got to connect to people, you got to use DNS, which is fairly centralized, and a bad UX. So we're fussing around with the idea of once we get data identities in there, having it so you could publish your bookmarks, publish dats that you've created and basically start to create this kind of giant DAT-based listing of all the content that's on DAT. And then what if Beaker went around indexing that stuff and we put in a built-in search engine? Then you could have this search index that you create yourself and you add friends to, and then you could just run searches against the DAT network, and then you're completely peer-to-peer. I think that's kind of a neat idea. So we're futzing around with that idea, which is part of why I've been working on these specs like record protocols and stuff to try to get us to that finish line and maybe we could get a built-in peer-to-peer search engine, which I think would be really cool. And then if you did that and you had reliable search, you could actually start to replace DNS. And instead, of using DNS and PKI, you could still have that in there, you'd still want that in there, but you could also use Web of Trust certificates instead of PKI certificates. So I could land on a site and it doesn't have, it's a DAT hash which is ugly, but it could say on the left of it where that certificate information is, it could be like, hey this is Paul's site, your friends, you know, Mike and Andrew and Septies all say that this is Paul Frazee. It's like a Web of Trust certificate and now you are totally decentralized. So that's kind of something I'm working on right now. That's kind of what I'm looking at for the post-08 work. Seeing if we could build a search engine into Beaker and a web of trust. So we'll see. That's one part of the stack that I'm excited about. The other part that I'm excited about is using pure sockets and basically creating on it. Maf said he's coming up with the term progressive deployment, which is where you could create a website 
a web app and people connect to you via PureSockets and you're basically just running the app out of your computer but actually you could locate the server anywhere so it could be inside your browser or you could get a node script running somewhere and use PureSockets and people connect to you on the node server and it just completely abstracts away the server and since it's using the Kademlia you can hole punch and start running services from any device browser, node, Google exactly Yeah, it's Beaker and it's Search. You're searching. Maybe we call it Bing. Wait, no, that's no good. I think that one's taken. Hmm, somebody's at the door. Hi, you're not Marina. No. No. Have you voted already, though? We have. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. Did you score better? We did. Can I hand you a bumper sticker? Let's do it. Awesome. Folks are canvassing for Beto O'Rourke, so we've got some bumper stickers, which is sweet. I'm not going to, you know, tell anybody how I vote necessarily, but I will put these bumper stickers up, and you can infer from that what you will. Voting evangelists are a thing in the States. Yeah, we, we call them canvassers, and that's actually the second canvasser for Beto that I've gotten, which is pretty surprising, actually. Canvassing has been going on for a long time, door-to-door -door canvassing with, with elections, but for reasons that are pretty obvious, this has been a pretty intense bit of canvassing on this election. At this rate, I'm guessing I'm, guessing I'm going to get two more of them before the actual election shows up. we still got a week and a half or so. Yeah, voting evangelists are a thing. Yeah. Okay, this thing just takes forever to build. Yeah, between the uh, pure sockets and getting a web of trust going, I think we can actually start to build better applications. Might as well get into this because we're sitting here waiting for the build to happen. Um, the stack right now that we have for building apps is not bad, but it's not great. It's hard to connect to people. It's hard to basically have a, any kind of a social experience created. Um, and that's been a, a real blocker. DAT, as a way of publishing data, is fantastic. You know, it's really nice that you can create uh, websites that can read and write files on the network. But there's no multi-writer yet. We're still working on that. And so you can publish files and stuff, but um, actually building an app that can send data between people is, takes a little bit of work and we were able to build that proof of concept with Fritter and you know the way Fritter works is you publish your status updates as JSON files and then you follow people and you download their their stuff which is good uh, the problem is that it's a pull based network which means that I have to explicitly follow everybody so that I'm downloading their stuff so how do we solve that uh, two different ways. One of them is if we build into the browser a way for people to create their personal network, their web of trust, a way of saying like I want to sort of like uh, I have a data identity that's built into the browser and here are my list of contacts of people that 
I want to see what they are doing on the web, kind of like a little social network built in, then uh, I can be pulling down stuff that they publish on their DAT, and then any application I use that leverages that identity is able to tap into that network. So it's like a way of creating a social database uh, of DATs. Um, and it's only comprised of people who I want to get data from, which means it's a web of trust fundamentally. It's people that I trust to give data. But it could be used across multiple different applications. Um, so that's like a that kind of web of trust slash like a social graph will end up powering, I think, a lot of different applications that are built on this idea that the web is full of people publishing data and I choose who I want to get that data from and then I can pull it down onto my computer and I can build out you know, the built-in search engine with that and I can build social applications that tap into it and pull the posts from people in my network and all that kind of stuff. So that's step one, one part of the solution to building these applications, I think, is making it so that there is a way to have a network you can tap into for pulling data. Solution number two is going to be the pure sockets. Because with the pure sockets, you can join into these DHT rooms and start arranging connections with people. And then you can start to exchange messages directly from one device to another, and that's a push mechanism. Uh, both of them are sort of small network design in the sense that, like, um, my little social graph is probably not going to be more than, you know, 500 dats that I pull from. And, and then whenever I get onto a site that's using pure sockets, I'm probably going to connect to, you know, um, not more than a few hundred people at most. Um, but that's still a... Oh, no, it's not going to build... <laughs> Oh. Anyway, so that's a that's a, still a lot that you can can build that way. What just failed? Huh? SQLite failed to build. You know, I'm going back in time using an older version of Electron, but it, it all should still work. Oof, Electron 182. Hmm, it's going to be hard to write this migration if I can't run an old version of Beaker. You may just have to abort on this idea. Because if I can't test it, I can't feel good putting it out. But let's see. Let's find out if I can get this thing to run. Gosh, this makes me nervous. So now I'm wondering if I'm going to corrupt my data set. But I really need a VM is what I need. Do I have the guts to try to run this thing? No, I don't think I do. I think people are just going to have to manually fix these things. Sorry, folks. I'm not going to do this migration. It's just too risky. All right, sorry for... Uh, sorry for burning all that time and not ending up doing that change, but... Just don't feel comfortable with the data manipulation I'm going to have to do. And if I can't, I really need a VM to run 07 because I'm afraid that I'm going to screw up my own install and this is just, it's just exceeded the amount of effort that it's worth. I'm also nervous about writing the migration code correctly. So we're just going to move on. All right. Well, that's pretty much everything I had planned to do. So we got a little bit of time if anybody wants to hit any topics before I close up the stream. Um, 
Let me grab the URL to all the spec work I'm doing. None of this stuff is final yet, but I want to keep everybody abreast of this. Got a new repo. For every, I'm going to start being more rigorous about specking the beaker code and any standards that we're working on. And this is the meta repo. Every spec gets its own repo, and they'll all be linked to from here. We've got the dat.json spec, the dat types spec, the dat identity spec, record protocols, and the unwalled garden schemas that I'm working on. Uh, unwalled garden is the domain name that I bought recently. That's where we're going to, at least it's currently, the plan to publish all the spec, the uh, schemas that Beaker itself publishes will be under unwalled garden. Uh, record protocols is there if you want to take a look and give me your thoughts about it. I, again, I don't think it's 100% what I'm going to stick with because I'm not totally satisfied with it. Uh, but it has a lot of the basic ideas that I'm trying to accomplish. And I think maybe what I'm going to do is take some of these ideas and try to simplify them a little bit, make them a little more exciting as an end user of them, because we're going to be stuck with whatever this solution is for a while, and I just don't want to blow it. So I'm going to take some of these ideas and maybe break them down into their components and then turn it into uh, something at some point. But basically, it's all about getting good metadata and... Um, and a user-friendly sort of permissioning system. So I'm going to give it some more thought. So yeah, check out Beaker Browser slash Specs. Maybe watch the repo if you want to find out when new specs are being published. I don't know if you'll get a notification about that, but this is where I'm doing all that spec work. All right, I think putting the chat in the stream is uh, pretty cool. Docker would help isolate the uh, old version. Docker or some kind of VM is what I need, but the problem is that my computer cannot <clears throat> cannot handle running a live stream and a Docker at the same time. It's an old MacBook Air, and it just doesn't have the CPU or the or the RAM. All right. Well, thank you all for coming, as usual, as always. Um, you can find me online, IRC, GitHub, Twitter, and email, so feel free to reach out. And uh, I'm going to keep on working on these specs, keep on working on um, these ideas like the uh, peer sockets and the, uh, and the search engine, perhaps. See what happens. And uh, Septis is going to keep on working on new editing tools and stuff. We'll get the Fav Icon editor out there soon. So hopefully, uh, hopefully not too much longer. So thanks everybody for coming on, and I'll see you next week. Have a good one.